Good afternoon and welcome to the third installment of the UP Institute of Civil Engineering webinar series. To formally start, may we call on our Institute Director, Dr. Maria Antonia Tanchuling. Good afternoon po sa ating lahat. <laughs> welcome to our webinar. This is part of our, <clears throat> this is one of the activities that ICE is proud to present to you as part of our, the celebration of our 110 years. <clears throat> Sorry, 110 years of uh, the BS Civil Engineering Program. So we have uh, several activities lined up. So we have, uh, aside from the webinar series, we have uh, the poster exhibit, which we are showing through Facebook. I'm not sure if I have slides for this, so I'll just uh, try to recount. <laughs> My slides, ba? Uh, okay. <laughs> the, we have the poster exhibit, and then we have, uh, we released a, a video report of uh, how UP Institute of Civil Engineering is now. Please try to look it up from our Facebook page. And then we also have a photo contest. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, the alumni among you to share with us your photos and your stories regarding your memorable uh, uh, experiences while, while being in UP. And then we're planning to have a virtual recognition rights for our, and for our students on July 25th. And then this uh, this webinar is the third of the of the series of webinars that we have lined up. We have already presented twice. We, we started with a with one on water resources modeling, and then last week was about the civil engineering profession. And then next week will be about transportation. And then on the twenty fourth will be about the field. Uh, Philippine Building Act. So all of this, we try to tackle uh, what the conditions would be in the new normal. So for this week, we're tackling construction management. So when the when the pandemic struck us, a lot or maybe all aspects of our lives uh, drastically changed. No, so kasama na din siya yung uh, construction management. Now we wonder how to go about things, how, how to go about uh, construction. What would be the changes you know, if under the new normal? How do we, uh, what changes should be implemented? And then, kumusta naman ang supply? Maputupul ba? What will we have shortage of? So all of these uh, issues we are uh, wondering about. So for this afternoon, these issues will be tackled by our guests uh, who are also CE alumni. So I'd like to thank uh, both of you, Engineer Bo Gangayko and Dr. Francis uh, Felizardo. Maraming salamat for accepting our invitation to be our lecturers for this afternoon. So later they be properly introduced by our moderator. Anyway, thank you so much to, uh, to both of you. And to all our participants, thank you so much for being here, for attending our webinar. For those who have been watching our shows, our webinars, we really appreciate your support. So special thanks to our co-sponsors, PICE, UPRDFI, and the CE reps. Thank you so much. I'd like to especially uh, thank Engineer Rampi Nolido for helping us put this together, for contacting our, our speakers. So, maraming salamat. So, I hope you have a very good afternoon. This would be a very uh, educational two hours. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to introduce the moderator for this afternoon. He, 
in introducing our speakers and also moderating the Q&A. So our moderator for this afternoon is Dr. Nathaniel Chola, or we call him Boji. Boji is one of the professors of Institute of Civil Engineering. He used to be the director of the Building Research Service at uh, UPNEC. He is the head of our Constructions and Materials Testing Laboratory, also a part of the technical panel for civil engineering of uh, CHED. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call on Dr. Boji Jola. Take it away, Boji. Ah, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Director Tonet. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have uh, 139 participants and increasing uh, in Zoom, you know, as well as uh, in uh, Facebook. So um, easily, I would estimate that we have uh, around 200, I think, uh, participants. So yeah, uh, my task for today is to uh, uh, be the moderator and to give you an overview of what will happen. So first, um, we'll have uh, uh, this uh, program here you now as a seat on the screen. So we'll have two talks uh, from 3.15 to 3.45, that would be the first talk. And then the second talk will be uh, from 3.50 to uh, around 4.20. Uh, please take note that uh, we will have the Q&A after the two presentations. And then we will have some video presentations before we have the closing remarks. Okay, so that's it. Now, uh, just to put things in order, uh, may we remind our participants uh, of these house rules. Uh, to all attendees in Zoom, you may send your questions uh, via the Q&A button found at the dashboard. Please use the raise hand button if you would like to ask a question or to comment verbally. To the viewers on our Facebook Live, you can type in your questions at the comment section. Kindly state your name and affiliation so we can acknowledge you properly. We will screen, select, and answer the questions at the end of the lecture. Please take note that certificates of participation will be issued to Zoom attendees who have, number one, pre-registered, and number two, have answered our evaluation forms. A pre- and post-evaluation form will be launched in Zoom during the start and middle part of the webinar. All right. Okay, so I think uh, uh, we are ready with uh, our uh, presentations this afternoon. So uh, first, uh, let me uh, give you or formally introduce to you uh, our first speaker. I'm sure you are all uh, eager to uh, learn uh, new insights about uh, the new normal, especially about uh, well, about construction. No? So our uh, first speaker is a scholar, is a scholar ng bayan who graduated in 1985, uh, sorry, he graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering in UP Diliman in 1986. During that time, he was a student leader. He was the chairman of the UP Association of Civil Engineering Students. After graduation, he went on to work in the industry and picked up experience, additional learning, and credentials along the way. He was, uh, Officer in charge for rent, equipment rentals at Gang Kaiko Construction, Cadet Civil Engineer in, at DM Konsunhi Incorporated, General Manager at Bogan Trackers, and was responsible in overseeing site development, quarry operations, material sourcing, and heavy equipment leasing. In 1986, he took on the role of President and General Manager for Equip Horizontal Constructors Incorporated and handled aspects of construction including but not limited to operations, finance, human resources, and marketing. Our speaker believes in lifelong learning. In 2006, he received a Master's of Science in Finance from UP Diliman and was a program scholar. He continued with his professional work as engineering manager for Versar International Assistant Projects, Manila, where he ran the day-to-day -day operations and headed the Manila team of engineers that catered 
to Q&A QA requirements of over $2.3 billion worth of contracts. Uh, currently, our speaker is the Managing Director of Design Coordinates Incorporated. He is responsible for the overall direction and project and management of an entire business responsibility unit. He ensures that all construction project management plans are carried out expeditiously and efficiently and is responsible for simultaneously managing multi-billion projects and front lines for the firm on clients' executive level concerns and requirements. You might ask, what are these multi-billion projects? Multi-billion peso projects. These include SM Mega Mall Tower, SM Capital Tower and other SM properties, the Zaitan, Widus Hotel and Casino, and many more. We might take the whole afternoon to enumerate them all. But ladies and gentlemen, let me now give your speaker who is a registered civil engineer and a certified project management professional. Here to share with us his thoughts on construction management during COVID-19, a practitioner's perspective. Let's all welcome engineer Bo Gangkaipa. Sir Bo. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen first. the screen. Give me a few minutes. There you go. Um, thank you very much for your introduction, Doc. At this point, uh, all I can say is I'm honored greatly by this opportunity to share with everyone my personal take on the challenges that we are now faced. Not only for the profession and industry, but for the entire economy and nation. On screen are the topics I hope to briefly touch on today. Uh, I will focus on the fourth bullet, which is the construction phase of a project. Um, but I will first start with an introduction on what we do, you know, the landscape of the construction industry, and a brief discussion on a project's life cycle as we move to the new normal. My UP student number is 8105616. I still remember it. And I graduated in 19, 1986, no? the year of the ENSA revolution. Classes were also canceled for an extended period then, similar to what we are going through now. No? but uh, it was a lot shorter. I joined Design Coordinates, uh, now called DCI, in 2007, and I jumped the fence from contractor to CM. I've never looked back. DCI is definitely among the leading construction management firms in the country right now, with about 500 engineers and architects. It employs uh, 130 civil engineers of various job levels, and manages about 80 construction projects in various phases nationwide. For today's webinar, I'd like to share with you some of our ongoing lockdown learning processes. I say ongoing, no? as we manage a project amidst a COVID-19 backdrop. In the title of today's webinar, I use the phrase construction management. Often I'm asked to differentiate between a construction manager and a project manager. In DCI, the designation is called construction project manager to emphasize that the manager uh, is a manager of a construction project. In the local setting, these designations are used loosely and our roles are, have evolved in the past decade to adjust to the owner's or the project scope requirements. The CM is engaged as a consultant for the project in the same manner that an architect or a structural designer is placed on board. Our scope is largely determined by the phase of the project our services are needed. In the global setting, the distinction between PM and CM is more defined, with the PM as a man on top of the entire project, working with the principal stakeholders, mostly on an elevated perspective, and supervising the project indirectly through the CM. CM, as he is also called, commonly used, called, no? spends most of his time in the field and is very hands-on with operations. 
locally the industry is spearheaded by the construction project management association uh, construction management association of the philippines or cp map it was established in 1990 globally there is the project management institute or pmi which is the certifying body for pmps or project management professionals on screen, you see what is known as the quality triangle, which shows you the constraints of any project. The mandate of the CM is to safeguard and balance these constraints throughout the project's life cycle. Even mainly by the construction boom in the past decade, the scope and work of the CM has evolved from merely safeguarding the four project constraints to another portion. The PMI enumerates this expanded scope through what they call the PM book or the project manager's book of knowledge. It has a portion where they call the 10 knowledge areas. For today's presentation on the construction phase, I will align my slides to these 10 knowledge areas. To proceed, I'd like to share with you some insights on the highlights of the construction industry or the movement and trends that have taken place in the last 120 days. So before the lockdown, Q1 2019 to Q1 2020, the construction grew by 2%. For Q2 2019 to Q2 2020, construction industry was slaughtered by an 89% contraction. It is estimated that 65% of the projects launched in Q4 2019 have been deferred on account of COVID-19. For government projects, the direction is to tweak the one trillion allocation for flagship infrastructure of build, 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 and move it to prioritize health and digital infrastructure. On the private sector, Developers are slashing their capital expense budget as a result of lease write-offs on their malls and commercial lease spaces. Revenue from Q2 2020 have been negligible, so pipeline projects for the rest of the year are being revisited. Continuous BPO leases have saved the day for lessors, but growth for these offices will be anemic as more and more firms will transition to remote teams for conducting businesses, again on account of COVID-19. Residential sales are at its lowest and default rates for loans are expected to peak, prompting pre-selling developers to provide interest-free promos and revitalize sales. What is still going strong are industrial and housing projects where the demand remains substantial given pre-existing backlogs. Also, we anticipate hospitals and NGUs will move towards building detached healthcare specialty centers as these are the lessons they learned from COVID-19. The more established developers are already pushing for headcount deployment today as they're concerned with their committed completion dates to their buyers. So this is the last slide in the construction industry. No? Brings us now to the third bullet, the project life cycle. Technically, when you say project, you mean end to end, from design development to budget allocation, to budget alignment, procurement. Then we go to project execution to close out. Using the local industry jargon from pre-construction to con to post-construction, the pre-con is where the design development takes place. Budget is aligned, procurement is conducted, and this could take anywhere from six months to two years, depending on the complexity of the design of the project. In the same manner, construction could take anywhere from six months to three, three four, maybe five years. No? Post-con length depends on the type of project and usually could uh, take anywhere from one, one month to six months. For the PMI, they prefer to look at the project as a compilation or a string of activities which undergo a set of processes 
what they call process groups. As shown in the diagram, each process group is composed of five um, processes. There is the initiating phase, there's the planning process group, there is the execution process group. All throughout, there's the monitoring and controlling process group, and then there's the closure. As shown in the diagram, these five process groups um, compose the project. No, the entire the entire construction project can be considered as an accumulation of these process groups. My main intent is to call out that the largest curve in the diagram, called the execution phase, is actually the construction phase. In a construction project, the execution process is the construction phase. As you can see, while it is clear that the most dominant curve on the diagram is the construct is the execution. There are also four other non-construction processes which are taking place. The reality is that the construction phase or execution phase or execution process consumes only about 50 to 70 percent of the tasks to be done in the project. The rest of the work involve off-site processes done through meetings, meetings with the clients, design consultants, contractors. For the entire project team, a substantial amount of time is spent reviewing drawings, submitting billings, responding to emails, preparing presentations. So amidst COVID-19, how are all these off-site tasks to be conducted? What you see on your screen are screenshots of our monthly ProManCom. In DCI, the Project Management Committee, where all 80 project heads, or CPMs, as we call it in DCI, meet up with the Executive Committee to discuss concerns. As early as the first week of March, the digital platform was tapped as the anticipated means of communication for the firm. So throughout the lockdown, communication lines were not only open, but were actually active as we continued collaborating with the stakeholders of the project. The company was fortunate enough to gain board approval for full continuous pay as it felt confident that the projects could continue to, 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 service, to be the service despite the initial pronouncement of a lockdown. The board recognized that the ultimate, its ultimate assets, well, asset was its headcount, so it supported the employee base throughout. As you can view in the screen, uniforms were required, even virtual. No? The general expectation was if you are not in a meeting, you are preparing for one. Other than design and procurement coordination meetings, internal meetings were also continuous. Firm-wide continuous monitoring of the health conditions of our employees, as well as the workers who were locked in the job site, who were locked in the job site, were in place. Trainings were conducted throughout the ECQ and GCQ months as it was a good time to enhance interdisciplinary skills for the population. We were sharpening the saw. The lockdown proved to be a good period to also zero in on streamlining the firm's organizational process assets. This is the technical term for processes, procedures, and policies. Upon entry to GCQ, we, recommended, uh, we rec recommenced our site audits and these, conduct, these were conducted virtually too. All firms have had to keep a pace with the government mandated guidelines and department orders, which were constantly being, which were constantly being superseded and updated. For us, we managed to roll out to the contractors return to work guidelines, which had to be in place previous to re-entering the project sites. Contractors in return submitted their execution plans on how they would comply with the government regulations and proceed with the construction despite COVID-19. Given the variety of, portfolio, of our portfolio, the different risk appetites of our clients and the anticipated efforts to recover lost time, we rolled out recovery readiness manual to assist our teams. We also anticipated that cost considerations would be a major concern so a guideline for construction time and cost claims was also generated internally to our teams. Kidding aside, so for most, we understand it was work from home. 
for some of us in DCI, the lockdown was more like uh, SOI or uh, SIO or sleeping in the office. We move on to the concern areas, the post ECQ or to, to some GCQ, where we have now been allowed to return to work to our project sites no? and proceed with the actual construction effort. I show a new slide presented earlier on knowledge areas. Allow me to table the construction phase concerns by briefly tackling each knowledge area and aligning it to, to the project. So there are 10 knowledge areas which we will, we, will, we will address. Scope, time, cost, quality, human resources, communication, risk, procurement, stakeholders, and integration. Let us first visit our, revisit our position on communication management, which was already presented earlier. We feel that while before COVID-19, digital technology and virtual communication was a matter of preference, this is now a transition that needs to happen. Market pressure will dictate our embracing of the digital world if a firm is to survive. Scope management for the suppliers, consultants, and contractors will most probably be retained, barring their failure to, com to keep their commitment in their resp respective contracts. I would actually look at scope management as the owner's direction to continue or defer the entire project. So it will be a matter of whether a project will remain a go or be deferred and postponed and be a no-go. What we can expect is expansion plans pending on the pipeline. And the waiting award will probably remain pending at least for Q3. For quality management, compliance to specs must be observed as quality is non-negotiable. Workmanship is either compliant or non-compliant. So there remains no middle ground despite COVID-19 as owners' expectations on quality levels remain unchanged. Contractors need to come up with a workaround on the methodology to accomplish their respective tasks. On procurement, we need to verify immediately if lead time is sufficient still, particularly for the equipment with long lead times. Constraints on logistics and material transit, also delivery to the site, have to be anticipated. I understand that after my presentation, Dr. Francis Felizardo, my classmate in college, will update us on RC, and I eagerly await his input on the, in, on the supply. The teams also need to collectively address importation concerns of the countries, countries of origin of the project equipment and materials, and the ability of suppliers to export from their own country. Due diligence needs to be conducted on the manufacturer's own COVID-19 status in their location and whether or not they can adhere to quality to their own schedules. On risk, let's look at some concept, concepts on risk. Risk tolerance globally is very low because risk of infection deals directly with numerous human lives. Risk appetite is the stakeholders and to a certain extent the workforce's willingness to proceed back to work despite COVID-19. So because of the economic concerns of the stakeholders, the risk appetite of stakeholders is now increasing. We have three responses, responses on the table. We can avoid, which we did in ECQ, meaning we simply shut it down. We can accept which means we don't do anything and we just live with the risk. Or we can mitigate, which means we try to reduce the possibility of occurrence by implementing protocols which will dampen possibility of occurrence. So obviously, the option is, the last option is to mitigate. If we merely avoid the health risk, then we are making the entire country susceptible to an economic risk. 
This is why the, pressure, the government is pressured to mitigate, not avoid COVID-19. There is also such a thing as positive risk that has surfaced, which is the appreciation of the virtual world and for which we are supposed to exploit and, use this, and utilize this development. Easily the most immediate concern are the required site protocols rolled out by the various government agencies to safeguard human lives. So in addressing human resource management, we look at the protocols rolled out. Some of the requirements are very realistic and workable, like disinfection, posting of appropriate social distancing signage and markers, and temperature checks. Sites are also required to provide an isolation area as shown in the photo, and this is very practical. The requirements on the mandatory 14-day quarantine period, population testing, and ingress-egress constraints are proving to be a challenge. Stipulations on staff housing within the project may readily be workable for infra projects along highways where there is plenty of real estate to build in. But for high-rise complexes located in the commercial districts of Makati, BGC, or Tigas, confining 200 to 300 men at a minimum within the project site could be a health hazard in itself. Provisions for basic necessities and utilities, waste management, and implementing Implementing social distancing throughout could be a handful. Protocols in case of infection within the quarantined workers could also be a major consideration. The question is, how do you practice social distancing while pouring concrete? Difficult, but can be done. These concerns have been raised to IATF and DBWH by the CP map, and we are appealing that these protocols be voluntary instead of required, but subject to compliance and inspection by the LGUs. On stakeholder management, a proponent's EEF, or Enterprise Environmental Factor, is the technical term for culture. This could dictate the level of flexibility and openness of an enterprise and will play a major role in the immediate resumption of work of the contractors. This is because EEF considerations, including the client's stand on who will pay the costs brought about by COVID-19 will be addressed. In the same manner, there are some contractors who are flexible and already eager to deploy their manpower, confident that they can file for time and cost. Other contractors will play it safely and show compliance with the government mandated protocols but will not commence work until corresponding instructions and POs are issued by the, by the owner. These PMIs will be crucial in supporting their claims later on. I admit and anticipate that this will be one of the more challenging tasks for the CM. On time management, the uh, legitimacy for an extension of time or EOT claim for the lockdown period is obvious, as contractors would be violating the law and jeopardizing if they did uh, the principles if they did not comply with this government directive. The reputation of the client and even the CM, if work is pursued, would be on the line no? during ECQ. The need for a runway period to remobilize, to construct the staff housing and comply with protocols, to consider possible constraints on the logistics. We call these residual claims. And EOT considerations are being reviewed on a case-to-case -case basis and in consonance with the owner's input. Last week, in one of our biggest, bigger projects, we managed to pour a substantial volume of concrete. Pouring took almost a day to complete, and it was within the, one of the commercial districts. 
Preparation took longer than usual as, of course, efforts to abide by social distancing were in place. I asked our engineers which portions of work was most difficult, and they shared that it was the rebar splicing efforts. I am sure that we can all appreciate the effort to install the 36 mm rebars, 12 meters in length for columns, and all throughout maintain a 1.8 meter social distancing. Overall, time management requires the CM to push for collaboration with the stakeholders of the project. And this is a major focus, focus area that is ongoing in our projects. Then there is cost. The costs of COVID-19. The direct cost of the protocols, the opportunity costs that some contractors would like to claim for during the lockdown and other residual costs peripheral to, peripheral to the work interruption. Our recommended first course of action is to review the contract documents, as this would always be the most important set of documents to refer to. In most cases, the expectation is the contract is silent on this. On the one hand, owner may claim that the contract is fixed lump sum and the costs are therefore part of contractor methodology. Contractors, on the other hand, will likely, likely cite COVID-19 as a fortuitous event and therefore unforeseen and therefore claimable. In our mind the CM, the partnership that bound the stakeholders together weighs substantially heavier than the cost placed on the table so a compromise will have to be met. I mentioned compromise. And this brings us to the last knowledge area, integration management. It is a compilation of all the tasks and processes which will ensure project delivery. As a practitioner, I consider construction management as an art form not solely a profession. The CM scope requires making trade-offs among competing stakeholder objectives, reviewing options and alternative, alternatives with skilled engineers and architects, all this while making everyone work as a team. Moving forward, the CM is tasked to find that sweet spot called compromise, where no one party is happy with the direction, but everyone is involved and is agreeable and willing to proceed. Wrapping up, I'd like to end this presentation by relaying my agreement to what uh, my dear friend Jack Ma said, that the challenge for 2020 on both a corporate and personal level is to survive and stay alive. So I end the presentation here, here and hope I managed to share with the viewers a CM practitioner's perspective of managing construction projects amid COVID-19. I'd like to thank Engineer Rambi Nolido for initiating this invitation uh, and the UP Institute of Civil Engineers as headed by Director Tonet Tanchuling for sp sponsoring the webinar. Uh, to Anjo, Victor, and Lea Diola who are in communication with me and of course to the moderator, Dr. Boji. Salamat, sir. And of course, too, many thanks to the very influential PICE for their support of this series. For queries, I've indicated uh, my email address. So keep safe, uh, everyone. Salamat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Bo, uh, for that uh, uh, presentation. You know? I'm sure our viewers uh, will have some questions on their minds. But uh, again, uh, as you have mentioned earlier, uh, we'll reserve the question and answer at a later time uh, during our uh, Q&A forum at the end of the two presentations. Okay. So um, uh, we thank again, uh, Engineer Bo, and uh, we'll uh, let him rest for a while, maybe have some coffee, and uh, we'll come back to him uh, later on. So again, please type your questions in the chat box. So let me now move on to our uh, 
next presentation. Right? Okay, our next presentation uh, will be given by another scholar ng Bayan. Okay? He is a graduate of BS Civil Engineering in 1985, magna cum laude. Okay? Um, and he started his career as a structural engineer for design management and development corporation. But just after two years, he decided to pursue graduate studies. He wants to learn more. Okay. He went to Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he earned his MS in 1990 and his PhD in civil engineering in 1993. While in the US, he put his talents into good use and worked on research projects at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego, California. In 1994, he returned to the Philippines as a DOST Balik Scientist Program Awardee. He joined the Department of Civil Engineering, University of the Philippines, as a professor, professorial lecturer. At the same time, he started his career in the cement industry with FINMA Incorporated as its manager for research and development. Paul Sim took over FINMA cement business in 2002. He took on various roles in FINMA and Holcim, including technical manager of their concrete operations, special products, and uh, cement sales, marketing, and distribution. He eventually became the senior vice president for aggregates and construction materials. In 2012, First Balfour Incorporated hired him as a consultant and he headed their concrete aggregates and hydropower projects. Our speaker is an active contributor to the construction industry. He has worked with the Philippine Contractors Association, the PICE, two of Holcim's global committees, the Cement Manufacturer Association of the Philippines, and the Philippine Concrete Industry Association. Our speaker is a member of the UP Engineering Research and Development Foundation Incorporated, our benefactor at ICE. Uh, each year, he and his wife, Leia, have been sponsoring thesis grants since 2006, and they generously donate to UP RDFI programs. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you the president and CEO of Monte Piedra Aggregates Corporation, who will discuss cement, concrete, aggregates, and rebar supply outlook. Let's welcome Dr. Francis Felizardo. Take it away, Doc Francis. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jola. And um, thank you, everybody, for attending this uh, meeting this afternoon. Okay, so let me start my presentation. I'll do a share screen. Okay, okay, so let me start. So my topic this afternoon, I want, to, I want to give you an outlook of the raw materials that goes into uh, structural concrete or reinforced concrete, and also for plain concrete. Okay, so let me just say something about uh, my company. So the company is uh, Monte Piedra Aggregates Corporation. So we started in 2017. So a few friends and I, so there were like five, five of us who already graduated from Holcim and from FINMA. So we said, you know, you can apply you know, the things that we learned uh, managing, you know, big company, professional management into our own business. So we decided to set up our own business and applying the principles that we learned in Holcim, in FINMA, and in my case, in First Balfour as well. Okay, so that's where Monte Piedra comes in. Uh, our first operation is uh, an aggregate quarry uh, here in Concepcion, Iloilo. So if you need aggregates, uh, don't forget to call me. Joke lang. Okay. So, yeah. so anyway, what I'll do the, uh, this afternoon is I'll give you an overview and then I'll talk about concrete, aggregates, cement, reinforcing bars, and then I'll summarize everything. Okay. So to start, so I, so I ordered a chicken and egg an egg from Lazada. So I'll tell you what happened later. So if you didn't get the joke, di ba parang, okay, I, I ordered an, a chicken and an egg. So you'll ask, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Okay. 
So in our case, uh, I brought this up because in many ways, the situation we have now is parang chicken and egg then, diba? So demand went down and so no, para since there's nobody buying so and at the time nai and the market is beginning to start up but the demand is slowly picking up and sometimes it's a, it's chicken and an egg so some of our customers complain i we actually wanted to pour concrete kaya lang kulang ng bato or kulang ng cemento or whatever else no and actually in the last few weeks uh, through my contacts in the cement and concrete industry we've been trying to parang help match my friends who are contractors at the same time with my contacts in cement and in uh, uh, concrete and in aggregates. Okay, so so, you know, no? so we want to grow at the same time or we want to come back at the same time that the construction industry is coming back. So th this is what's happened. So gross value added in construction, as you'll notice, since 2013, which is where uh, the PSA starts their report uh, at least is available online. So the industry has been growing at the rate of about 10% per year. Okay, so in, in, in uh, let's say 2013, uh, private construction was 460 billion pesos and government construction was about 120 billion pesos. Uh, by 2019, private industry was already, or private construction was already 770 billion pesos and government projects were about 300 billion pesos, so a total of 1 trillion 70 uh, billion pesos in gross value added construction by 2019. They were actually expecting that by 2020, another 10% growth. But in reality, what happened was, as mentioned by engineer Gantaiko earlier, because of COVID, uh, co construction projects uh, stopped. Okay, so we're in a situation now where uh, we're down to minimal construction and we want to we want to go back. So what is the effect on the supply of construction materials? So first, ready mix concrete. So ready mix concrete, as uh, I'll focus in Metro Manila because in a way, that's probably where much of the audience uh, today is. So sa Metro Manila, you have two clusters of batching plants. So one cluster is in the north, in the Quezon City, Valenzuela uh, area. So there's like a cluster of batching plants there. And then sa south naman, the cluster is around uh, Pasig, Tagig, Paranaque. So the north batching plants normally serve the Quezon City, Malabon, basta that, the north market. And then the south batching plants normally serve Makati, uh, Pasig, uh, Fort Bonifacio, etc. Paranaque. So kung where the project is near, you, you'd expect that the batching plants near the project are the ones supplying that. So it's not just in Metro Manila. No? So even like say uh, Cavite, Laguna, so there's actually a string of batching plants in the Cavite area and also in the Laguna area because that's a growth area. There are a lot of industrial parks, subdivisions, um, uh, road projects, so there's a good market for ready mixed concrete in that area. And most uh, metropolitan areas have a fair number of concrete batching plants. So I'm actually not worried in uh, sa supply ng ready mixed concrete. I was actually, I mean, I've been on and off in that business for more than 25 years. And you know, what I say is uh, concrete, it's fun for the engineer, headache for the businessman, because it's so easy to get into that business that by the time you start making money, uh, competitors actually start come in and uh, help share the money with you. Okay, so so even if you can't get concrete, if the project is small enough, um, you can always make your own device. So you either get a one bagger mixer, but you know one of the things that has come up recently, at least in my experience, is that uh, I've had a few parang inquiries from developers who are worried about supply security and are actually looking into putting up their own batching plants so that secure sila. Kasi to build, I mean, to make your own concrete, you just need coarse aggregates, fine aggregates, cement, water, additives, and then put up a simple batching plant and then run it. So it's not a difficult uh, um, plant to put up yourself. 
Okay. So, long story short, uh, batch plants, ready mix concrete, there was a supply disruption, uh, but it's easy to get back. Okay, so aggregates. Uh, aggregates, the story is, uh, is similar, but siguro a little bit complicated. So to explain how aggregates are made, so first you need feed material, and then you need to put up your crushing plant. So for example, in our case, our crushing plant is, our, our crushing is done in two stages. So we feed head size uh, boulder materials into a jaw crusher. So that's about mga 300 mm maximum size. And then from the jaw crusher, the product is about 100 mm size, so mga four inches. And then we do secondary cr crushing uh, using a cone crusher. So the output there, lalabas mga G1, the three fourths, the three eighths, uh, sand, and base cores, okay? And you have a screen that separates out the different components. And any oversize gets returned to the cone crusher for subsequent crushing. So again, in this case, uh, at least in our plant, usually about 50% of what we feed becomes G1, which is used for roads. About 20% is uh, goes into parang three-fourths, which is used for structural concrete sa mga buildings. Three-eighths as a blending material. And sand is about 15%. Okay. So where does the feed material come from? So there are two sources. So it's either you get from a river or you get from the mountain. So a river, uh, if you have a river that has a lot of sand and gravel, then some people, they just use that as is, but most uh, modern contractors actually would not be happy with that quality. So usually it's fed into a crushing plant so that you can get the sizes and the correct grading. In our case, so this is a picture of our quarry. So we have a mountain behind us. We drill holes into the rock, put explosives, and then blast, uh, do controlled blasting. And then that blasting, uh, sorry, that blasted material is fed into our plant and you get the aggregates that, you, uh, that we want to supply to you. Okay, so let's talk about Metro Manila. So, so Metro Manila, again, there's two clusters of aggregates plant, parang similar to the batching plants. No? So there's a cluster in the, San Mateo, Montalban area. Okay, so that those uh, crushing plants tend to supply the northern market. And then there's a cluster of crushing plants in the Antipolo, Angono area. And many of those crushing plants tend to supply the batching plants in the southern part of the market. Okay, for, for sand, uh, almost all, I might even say practically all of the sand that goes into Metro Manila comes from Pampanga. So uh, years ago, si Mount Pinatubo erupted and uh, released a lot of parang sandy material, yung lahar, di ba? And that, a lot of that lahar ended up sa Pasig Potrero River. And, uh, and along that river are several sand quarries and sand processing plant, plants. And those uh, sand plus processing plants if you hear yung Porac sand or Florida Blanca sand, so that's that's where uh, those sands come from. Okay, so what's what's the outlook for aggregates? So the outlook for aggregates is again because of lockdown and also because of uh, problems in logistics, it was actually hard to produce and even deliver aggregates to Metro Manila. Uh, it's begun to come back. And it, the demand is there, so uh, those guys are happy, happy to supply you, as are we. Okay. I would say the medium-term challenge, uh, sorry, the medium-term is that, you know, the market will normalize in the near future. Maybe the challenge in the um, foreseeable future is the fact that permitting and regulations have become more difficult, especially in the even the Montalban area and in the Antipolo area, as Metro Manila grows, yung subdivisions are enroaching into what used to be parang quarry areas, diba? And it's making uh, quarry operations and quarry permitting difficult. Okay? And we've also noticed that over the years, the government have actually start, has actually started to become even more strict in issuing permits. So to get a permit, first of all, well, you have to demonstrate that you are financially and operationally viable, but do you really know what you're doing? But at the same time, you have to 
uh, explain what is the impact of your operation on the environment and how do you protect the environment from what you're doing. And then lastly is, you have to get the consent of the community. Is the barangay happy to have you there or they don't want you there? Is the local government happy to have you there or they want you there? The barangay and the local government will always ask, what is the benefit of your operation in our community? Ano ba? Kailang bakikita or is there something that the community will benefit from you? Uh, as a company, kami sa Monte Piedra, we're actually happy to uh, work with the community. I mean, we want the community to grow with us. And if we make money, we also want to make sure that the community shares in that benefit. And at the same time, we think that uh, responsible quarry operators and miners is good for the country. And so, although regulations and permitting has become very strict and more challenging, in many ways, although it's difficult, we actually welcome uh, the controls that are reasonable. Okay, so I won't explain the nature of the permitting anymore unless people have questions, but uh, I guess the message is, in the near term, supply, I think, will be okay. But in the longer term, it will become more challenging as urban areas uh, approach or become nearer to the traditional quarry sites. Okay, so that's aggregates. So now let me talk about uh, cement. So I was in uh, FINMA and Holcim for about 15 years, uh, probably even more. So. Uh, this is a business that's also near and dear to my heart. So let me explain how cement is made. So your main raw material is limestone. It's like 80 or 90% of your raw material. And then you blend in silica, alumina, and iron, uh, pulverize that, and feed that into a kiln. You burn the material at 1,500 degrees Celsius. So out of that kiln, you produce what's called clinker. So the, you know, the picture here on the left, okay, that's clinker, okay? And that's your raw material for making Portland cement. So to make Portland cement, so it's like 95% clinker and 5% gypsum, you grind that in the cement mill and out comes Portland cement, okay? So Portland cement, especially here in the Philippines, you sell in bulk, we sell in 40 kilogram bags, we sell in tanner bags, uh, and before, when I used to uh, be with the cement business, we also exported in uh, 40 or 50,000 ton vessels abroad. Okay, so putting up a cement plant is not cheap. So it's about mga $200 million per 1 million metric, annual metric ton. So about 10 billion pesos for a 1 million ton operation. And Many plants today are like 2 million to 3 million tons. So it's a lot of money. And so, and it takes like maybe three to five years to put, put up a complete cement plant. So one way to shortcut that process is to actually outsource the production of clinker. So that's what's called a grinding station. And there are like a couple of grinding stations in the Philippines. So they would buy clinker from abroad. They would only put up clinkers, but everything in this box here. So only clinker storage plus cement mills et cetera, et cetera, and they're in the cement business. So the investment cost here is much lower. To bring down your investment cost even lower, the other way to do it is just put up a cement terminal. So you buy cement from abroad, you put that in a cement, you put up a cement terminal, and then you put that, the, the cement in your own bags or in bulk, and then start selling cement. No? So again, the investment cost is much, much less. Okay, so what does the local market look like? So there are about 20 cement plants, grinding stations, and import terminals in the Philippines. Okay, so you'll notice that of the 20, two are in Mindanao. I think three, are, three or four are in Cebu. And the rest are in Luzon. So the reason for that is 70% of cement is actually in Luzon. About 15% is in the Visayas and 15% is in Mindanao. So that's why the concentration of cement plants are actually in Luzon. And in fact, in the Mega Manila area, parang 40% of uh, Philippine demand is actually in the Mega Manila area. So that's why, again, you see the cluster of cement plants around Met Metro Manila. I mean, you can't put up a cement plant in Metro Manila itself, but around Metro Manila, supplying Metro Manila, that's where many of the cement plants are. Okay, so what's the demand situation? 
So like construction, cement demand was also growing at around mga 10 to 11 percent per year. Okay, so by 2018, the official data, we were at around mga 30, I guess 33 million tons ang consumption natin of cement. Okay. And the domestic nameplate capacity is around 35 million tons. So we're actually, we were already running at almost full capacity in 2018. 2019, the industry was expecting around mga 6 or 7, or they, there's no official data, but mga around 7% growth. No? So we were actually at nameplate capacity by 2019 already. Although there were additional, uh, there was additional production capacity that was added. So mas maluwag na siya ulit. Okay, so of course, ngayon 2020, it's, it's really down because of the slowdown in construction. Okay, so where does the cement come from? So, you know, the cement industry is a primar primarily domestic industry. So most of the cement in the Philippines is really supplied by local plants. So when we were approaching capacity, that's when importation started coming in. So some of it by the producers themselves, but a big part of it, ended up in uh, many traders, kumbaga. So by, like say, 2018, traders accounted for 4.7 million tons of, of uh, sales. The local producers imported 1.1 million tons, but they also produced 27 million tons of cement here in the Philippines. Okay, I don't have the 2019 numbers, but they would probably reflect what 2018 looked like. So again, the advantage in this business is because most of the suppliers are local, then uh, supply security is not a big issue. And even if supply becomes scarce, it's actually not that difficult to import over the long term. Siguro in the short term, because logistics, you have to set up the logistics, it's actually difficult. So nakita niyo yung ramp up ng importation was actually very slow in the beginning, but eventually, once they worked out the logistics issues, uh, importation became a big chunk of the supply in the Philippines. Okay, so that's cement. So story in cement is, uh, well, right now, not a lot of construction. So uh, cement supply was constrained because of lockdown and all that. But eventually, I think it will normalize and new capacity is being added. Okay, last is reinforcing bars. So to make rebar, you need billets. So billets are feed, or sorry, billets are fed into rolling mills and out comes steel reinforcing bars. Okay, so what does the reinforcing bar supply situation look, look like? Okay, so first, let me explain, how do you make billets? Okay, so there's two general ways. One is called the integrated process, and then the other one is called the semi-integrated process. So the traditional process is integrated. So iron ore, you convert into pellets. Coal, you convert into coke. And then there's others, mostly lime or limestone. And then they're fed into a blast furnace, which separates out iron from the impurities. So out comes pure iron. And so the pure iron goes into a steel mill where carbon and alloys are added, so you, which make, uh, makes the molten iron into steel. So the steel is fed into the casting process and in the casting process, as the steel solidifies, out comes billets, blooms, slabs. So in our case, billets and the billets go into a rolling mill where they, they are shaped into rebars. Okay, so this is the traditional way of producing uh, steel. It's actually very expensive to put up the plant there are actually no blast furnaces in the Philippines. And like even in the United States, they've actually gone out. Uh, many of the blast furnaces have actually gone out of business and are being replaced with electric steel mills or electric arc furnaces. So yung electric arc furnace, uh, electric mills are, ang feed material niyan is scrap iron or scrap metal. And kung kulang, then additional solid pig iron, which is a product ng blast furnace. Diba? So, Scrap metal is fed into the uh, electric furnace. They are melted, impurities are removed, carbon is added, uh, the right alloys are added, and then the melted material goes into the casting uh, uh, pot or whatever, and out comes billets, 
which are used to roll the uh, billet into rebar. Okay. So in the Philippines, all the furnaces are actually uh, electric furnaces. Okay. So with that, what's the billet situation looking like? Okay. So one advantage in the Philippines is we have our demand for rebars in 2019 is about 4.6 million tons. And the rolling capacity of the industry, the local rolling capacity of the industry is 6 million tons. So we have a very comfortable local rolling capacity. So as long as we have enough billets, the local producers can actually produce all the rebars that we need. Okay, so of the 4.6 million tons that were sold in 2019, 75% were imported billets. Then, uh, so 25% came from local furnaces, so electric arc furnace or induction furnace. I'm not going to go into the de details and difference in the two. But suffice it to say, about 1.2 million tons of our billets were produced locally and 75% or 3.4 million tons were actually imported, mostly from China. Okay, so all of that gets fed into a rolling mill and that's the rebar that we have today. There were actually some imported rebar, 1% to 2% of the total demand, and there's a, something called a re-rolled rebar. So this is parang old rebar that is recycled. Okay, so I don't think a high-rise building would want to use that rebar, but many parang small hardware stores and small projects would find that, that material acceptable. So that's around mga 1% to 2% of, of supply or of sales in 2019. Okay, so key points. So here in the Philippines, there are 20 uh, local rebar producers, but only five produce high strength, uh, yung grade 415 or grade 16 na rebar. Okay. Uh, local rolling capacity is 6 million tons per year. And the big three, so si Steel Asia, si Pag-asa, and si Cathay Pacific, own 50% of that capacity. Okay. So most of the cost of producing rebar is actually the billets. So you would think that since local billets are cheaper than imported billets, why not just put up more local furnaces? Diba? Kasi it's cheaper and also for supply security, it's actually much better to have the supply coming from the Philippines than having to depend on imports. Well, the challenge is, well, number one, capital cost. No? So it's like $100 million to put up a 500 ton, thousand ton per year electric arc furnaces, furnace. So that's like 5 billion pesos. So, I mean, I don't have 5 billion pesos, uh, and, but, you know, 5 billion pesos is not really a lot of money. The local capital market can, you can raise that in the local capital market, but it's still a big bet, diba? Right? So, uh, you have to make sure that you know what you're doing uh, if you want to, before you put, you plunk 100 million US dollars to put up a plant. But the other challenge, and maybe that's the bigger local challenge, is because the Philippines is not um, an industrial country, we don't actually produce a lot of scrap metal or scrap iron. So in fact, that's the other thing. So maybe you'll put up your furnace, but you have nothing to melt. So you lose your advantage. Uh, so you, don't, you lose your cost advantage and you wasted 5 billion pesos. Okay. The other one is uh, logistics. Diba? So the Philippines is an archipel archipelago. So okay, so Metro Manila, that's a big consumer of uh, steel rebar. But if you have to chop up your supply and send that to Cebu, Davao, maybe Iloilo, where I'm, where I'm in. Um, so it's a big logistics challenge. And also, again, coming from cement, so there's really just two kinds, you have Portland and Portland Pozolan. Uh, sa rebar, you have grade 33, you have grade 40, you have grade 60, ngayon there's grade 75, and then you have different diameters. Um, and then you also have different lengths. So uh, it's a logistics challenge, and uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm not in that business, I suppose. Oh, because it's it's challenging. Okay, so that's that. So let me summarize. Um, so during lockdown, supply and demand contracted. Okay, but it's actually begin beginning to recover as construction is beginning to recover as well. Actually, again, here in Iloilo. We were fortunate that we were never locked down. So, hindi naman kami na zero, but you know, demand is still much lower than what we'd like. And uh, in our experience, at least uh, in our sa customers namin, 
the big private developers are still parang they haven't come back. Government projects, uh, if a DPWH project has already started, uh, wala, tuloy, tuloy, tuloy na siya, no? but many DPWH projects that are supposed to be awarded, parang I think it, my impression is the government is still thinking about whether they want to uh, um, fund that project or not. Okay. So, but most of our sales now are actually government rather, rather than private. So, our outlook is demand will still be weak, but maybe cautiously optimistic because we've also seen a pickup in demand. So, for each of the different products, concrete, don't worry about it. Okay, plants are there and if, if you have a project, they will want to supply you. Okay, if you're worried about long-term supply, uh, put up a batching plant. Um, aggregates, uh, well, the in it during COVID, nawala, but it's coming back. Uh, but the medium term challenge, maybe medium term means mga three to five years, is uh, stricter government regulation and urban growth. Uh, that will make permitting for quarries uh, a little harder, especially near big urban areas. So, cement, the advantage is. The supply is mostly domestic, and if there's a shortage, imports will come in. So the local plants uh, have an interest and investment in making sure that the supply is reliable so that you don't have to import. And then steel rebar, the advantage is we have a lot of rolling capacity, much more than the current demand. But maybe the, the weakness is that we depend on China and imported billets for the feed material. But as far as rolling capacity is concerned, uh, we're very comfortable. So with that, I'd like to end the talk and I'd like to thank all these people in the list who actually um, helped me uh, get, get a read on, on the market. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Doc Francis. Okay, so um, I think uh, we are now ready for uh, our Q&A. So again, for those who would like to ask questions, please type in uh, in our uh, chat box. But but if you want to uh, participate no? and uh, be recognized uh, so that we'll be able to hear your voice, just raise your hand and we will make it happen. Okay, so... Right, so Engineer Bo, uh, I think your microphone is uh, off. Yes, okay, <laughs> so there it is. All right. Um, actually, there are there were many questions uh, earlier uh, in the Q and A box, uh, but some of those questions were already answered by uh, Engineer Bo. <laughs> I tried to answer them. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was half yes, listening to uh, Francis and half answering them. <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, maybe for the uh, in the interest for the interest of uh, those who are uh, listening, maybe uh, we could share uh, some of those uh, questions that were already uh, answered, and maybe you can uh, share your answer to them. No, uh, specifically perhaps on the um, problems that uh, uh, the construction sites are facing, and uh, what can we do as construction managers to address this. Uh, identified the uh, problems that we are facing at the construction site. Um, so I, I'm looking at the chat box, uh, uh, Doc. Is this correct? Would you yes, want sir, me yes, to sir. respond to the chat box? Yes, sir, please. Yeah, so the question is, what are the mitigating mitigation strategies that you think may help the contractors or engineering practicing offices to overcome the threat of this pandemic from engineer Mangubat from Bahrain? Uh, my response was temperature monitoring, proper use of PPE, random testing, continuously monitoring of population symptoms. No? Uh, honesty, and this is very crucial, honesty by team members in declaring symptoms. Mm -hmm. In short, preventive efforts. No? Um, on the, for the workforce, I understand the quarantine, but uh, I think that sometimes the constraint is unrealistic because uh, I, feel, I feel strongly that... Uh, Locking in 300 employees as a health hazard in itself, you no, know? and the possibility of contamination uh, by one could lead to a disaster um, and could 
So we're avoiding that situation. But internally, uh, like for DCI, uh, what we did was initially we rolled out a risk assessment. Ano? We, we classified the risk levels of all the employees firm-wide. Uh, for those with uh, comorbidities, for those with uh, the seniors, uh, uh, for those uh, younger in age uh, with no history, yan yan ang front lines because we need to work already. So those are the ones already on the sites today. Mm. But for the rest, some flexibility is allowed. No, but for the workforce and the job site, in the end of the day, compliance to the PPEs, the protocols. These are safe mesh. These are risk mitigation efforts uh, by the government, and we risk, we should respect them. We should respect them because these are sound. No, uh, there are only certain pro uh, protocols, certain constraints, which are very difficult. If you walk, if you go through Edsa, sir, uh, you will see some projects are already ongoing, some are not. Um, it's the risk appetite of the developer. Some contractors are really building the staff, staff houses uh, as required, uh, observing protocols to the letter. No, so that's my response. Um, I have another question. Considering there's a downturn in construction post-COVID, how big is the market for CM abroad? Well, anticipation is construct construction dip is global. So the CM market may not be as bullish, but you may have better chances on countries with stable, supportive, and ag aggressive governments. Now the anticipation is just for this question. Uh, the anticipation is worldwide after uh, when some, some normalcy is uh, obtained, uh, governments will pump funding to infrastructure to recover the economy. So you might have a chance there. Uh, yes, sir. So that question is, I think, similar to uh, what uh, John Patrick Santos of Mapua University asked earlier. So let me read the question. How will the new normal affect the practice of construction management in the long run? Like I said in the report, um, substantially a lot of uh, off-site uh, activities uh, design we'll, we will be pushing for. Um, Procurement and um, but um, budget uh, alignment. These are offsite activities which can be streamlined. No, I feel this this will be streamlined and substantially improved. Um, even meetings, um, they can be held virtually. So, like I said, it's a positive risk. Uh, Edsa. May need not be as traffic because we don't need to go through the traffic. We can have virtual meetings moving forward. Um, but on the job site, uh, prevention is the key. Uh, that's our position. Prevention is the key. Uh, so, and constant monitoring. So that's 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 how we're moving forward. No? So. Yes, sir. So yes, you mentioned that prevention is really the key, and uh, depending on the contractor's uh, appetite, risk appetite. Yes. Perhaps, uh, and uh, of course, uh, these uh, preventive uh, measures uh, cost some money. And in relation to that, there is a question on uh, who will shoulder the cost of mitigating the risk of COVID-19. Okay. So that's a good question. Uh, it puts it puts me on the line. You know? uh, this. But bottom line is, what does the contract say? That's the first question. What does the contract say on uh, unfortuitous events? So if it is included in the contract, normally the bulk of the contracts we are going through uh, does not insert, include it. So what does the contract say? The bulk of the contracts say are silent on this clause. So there will have to be a meeting, a meeting of minds between the, con the contractor who is tasked to, present, to, pre to protect his, his manpower, his human resource, and the developer who feels you know, you're contracted with a fixed lump sum and you should proceed. No? Uh, do, do what you need to do uh, to proceed with your methodology. So protocols are part of the methodology. So proceed with it. But in the end of the day, the cost is real and substantial. If you're talking about 
uh, 100,000 cost, that's readily doable. Talking about 500,000 cost for a big project, but if you're gonna ask 50 million, that is a deal breaker because that will put the finances of the project on hold. Mm -hmm. So a meeting of minds will have to be done. The GenCon or the, each contractor will have to address it individually in the same manner that uh, the developers will have to also recognize the costs that have been incurred by the contractors. Uh, on a case-to-case -case basis, even the consultants like us, we are deploying. Uh, everyone is required to be in PPE, but the, the costs are sometimes subsidized by the firm itself. Not everything will be charged to the proponent. So there will have to be that meeting of the minds. Yes. There will have to be that uh, handshake. Uh -huh. And the best alternative would be a partnership, uh, a commitment that please recover in our other projects. Uh, these other projects uh, is coming up. We'll help each other there. Here, let's continue with the project and complete the project. That would be my response, sir. Yes, thank you, sir. So uh, I think uh, you also put that in your slide earlier. You said compromise. <laughs> I think that sums it up. You know? And uh, I think uh, as long as uh, the stakeholders are, uh, uh, or they believe that, uh, in the project, then they will have to uh, make it work. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Doc Francis. Yes. Maybe we maybe can go, go to you. Um, do you also have these uh, problems like in, in the plants, aggregate plants, cement plants, and uh, maybe steel plants? How does uh, COVID-19 affect the work in the, in the plants? That affect Actually, the supply? Yeah, for manufacturing, it's a lot easier because just by the very nature of the work that we do. Um, so like a cement plant, a steel plant, and even an aggregates plant, uh, it's more equipment intensive rather than uh, labor intensive. So, for mm -hmm. example, in our quarry, uh, our parang staff, they work on mobile equipment. So, talagang, kumbaga, they're socially distant already yeah, just yeah. by the nature of their work. Even sa crushing plant, the operating room, there's like two people and it's a big operating room. So, so it's easy to enforce being up, uh, apart from each other. So maybe ang, I mean the the challenge for us is really more parang logistics and checkpoints, diba? So for example, during the lockdown, there were a lot of border controls, and there are a lot of requirements for you know if somebody. So for example, I'm here in Iloilo since mm -hmm. March 10. Uh, I can't go back because the somebody told me to go from Manila to Iloilo will cost you 35,000 pesos in. <laughs> quarantine costs and in testing, wala pa yung airfare, no? So, and you stay, I mean, if if you are healthy, you'll stay in a hotel for 15 to 20 days. If you get symptoms, maybe much, much longer. So, so it's more that. It's it's really mm -hmm. the challenge. I mean, the, the work itself is uh, naturally socially distant, but it's mm -hmm. actually the things around the uh, operation that actually makes it difficult for us. Okay, thank you, Doc Francis. There's a very specific question here, Doc Francis, uh, from Sherwin Mervin Burton Lucas. Hi, Doc Francis. I understand that your presentation does not include this, but do you also have an outlook for structural steel materials? Okay, I actually answered that question. So, sabi ko, um, I have an idea, but my information is secondhand. I'd rather double check before. So, I'll just answer him uh, later. If he sends me his contact info, I'll give him my answer. Because structural, structural steel is a much smaller part of the business compared to rebar. Rebar is like 10 times the demand ng structural steel. So I tend, so personally, uh, I tend to not follow the smaller parang portions of the business, at least the steel mm -hmm. side. But I can try to get, compose an answer to the question and then just send it later. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, let's scan for some other questions here. Uh, from Mark C, how do you see price of concrete, cement, aggregate, rebar in the next 12 months? Okay, so stay not in. So concrete, uh, well, no, we start with the inputs. So cement, because there's a big over, well, eventually there's going to be a big oversupply because in the drop of demand, uh, I don't think it's going to go up that much. You know, um, so I left, 
for SIM in 2010, the price of cement at the time was 200 pesos per bag. Mm -hmm. In Metro Manila, today it's like 200 or 205 pesos per bag. So 10 years and the price is still almost the same. Actually, if you're a big buyer, you can probably get it for even less. Yeah. So, so again, because of the big uh, oversupply and because it's so easy to import cement, I don't expect prices uh, to go up that high. See, Simon actually sent me a question saying, Eva, why are the cement prices announcing price increases? <laughs> so, I, know, I think they'll try, but I don't know if they'll succeed. Okay, so that's cement. Aggregates, um, it's actually hard to raise prices also. Um, because the thing is, demand is growing slowly, but it's you can easily put up supply. I mean, it's easy to run an aggregates uh, plant and to run production. So that's that puts actually a cap in how much uh, price increase you can put in. Uh, so concrete again, that business is so competitive. Uh, if you actually I mean, like Metro Manila, you can probably get quotes from five to ten concrete suppliers. If you're not happy with one, mm -hmm. uh, then try going to another. So it's actually also hard to uh, raise prices mm -hmm. there. The rebar is the one that I'm not sure, because although there are many uh, suppliers in Philippines, we actually depend on China and the global uh, uh, rebar uh, supply mm -hmm. for supply and at the same time prices. So if there's a supply shock then the price can significantly go up or significantly go down. Mm -hmm. But I would say because uh, global GDP is very weak right now, the trend seems to be that uh, steel prices for rebar, or for, sorry, for billets, and maybe even rebar, is probably going to be either stable or tendency to be weak. That's my guess. Okay, so there you are, the prices in the next 12 months. Uh, let me get back to uh, Engineer Bo. We have some few questions here, Engineer. So uh, this one looks interesting. Engineer Bo, from uh, Cliff Alingawad, what are the strategies that is very useful on negotiation with private owners using the COVID-19 pandemic as a reason to ask for time extension and additional cost? <laughs> um, to, in response, uh... We are reviewing productivity rates. No? I was explaining earlier uh, how difficult it is to maintain social distancing in the job site. Imagine installing a column uh, using 12, mm, uh, 12 meter, 36 mm rebar and practice social distancing. How is that done? You need the equipment, of course, yes. But uh, that definitely affects efficiency. So a, discuss a discussion is being needs to be presented there. But in the end of the day, uh, everyone takes a hit. Everyone takes a hit. Uh, the contractors need to take a hit too. Um, but the developers, I think, are also um, more flexible. You know? Some developers are flexible in that they understand the time impact on the efficiency of production in the job site you know? as, a, as a result of the protocols in place. So. Everybody has to work together. Uh, I, 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 I might not have mentioned, uh, emphasized it enough in my presentation, but one, one positive action moving forward is to recognize that the possibility of infection is there. And it would be irresponsible for the contractors or for the CM team or for the owners to lack on uh, the steps to take subsequent to infection. No, subsequent. So, dapat the uh, protocols are clear. Uh, what happens if there is an infection? Next step back. Next step back. So, these are the ones that have to be emphasized. Uh, the first call of action is prevention. But if you find out that there is an infection and then you have no game plan, that would be uh, the concern. So, that would be living in normal times. That there is a there is a virus, there is a possibility of infection. In case this happens, spark on the game plan. Pag wala tayo nun, wala tayong bakalapatang bumalik sa job site. Thank you, Doc. Hey, uh, thank you for that. So really, there, uh, there will there needs to be a lot of uh, planning, and uh, perhaps uh, you know uh, forecasting or yeah to be done by the managers so to anticipate this kinds of situation. Okay, uh, another question from, uh, this time for, for Doc Francis. 
there is a bit long from Emilio Villaflores in Bile. Engineer Emil from Singapore, all the way from Singapore. Hi, sir. I just want to ask if you consider the use of retarded or chemical retarder, <laughs> retarder for those concrete mixed, especially to those far distance, uh, job site. Now, what is the maximum limitations in terms of timing or hours to suit the quality requirements of concrete itself? Mm -hmm. I think uh, this is regarding, yeah, retarder yeah. use. So, yeah, so that's a, that's a fun question to answer. So, actually, super plaster sizers and retarders are used in most ready mix concrete produced here in the Philippines. Uh, so, well, for two reasons. So, number one is it, it extends the life of concrete. And at the same time, it's also, it also reduces how much water you need for, to hit a certain strength target. So, big again, you save on cement. So, cement that you, uh, concrete that uses uh, super plasticizers use less cement than concrete that does, that does not. So, if only for that reason, you'd actually want to use it. But, you know, getting to the meat of the question, which is how long can we... Um, how long can we keep agitating concrete before we have to discharge? So the textbook answer, according to ASTMC 94, is 90 minutes. So dapat, within 90 minutes after you mix all the ingredients, you have to discharge the concrete already. There, you can actually make some exceptions because there are many projects that are actually far from, far from the batching plant or maybe the discharge rate is very slow. That's, it is actually hard to discharge the entire load within the 90-minute period. So there's actually a parang loophole in that rule now. For as long as you can maintain the workability of concrete without, uh, ano to? without uh, having to add water, then you can actually kumbaga, waive the 90-minute rule. So basta, if, if the concrete is still okay, even without water, you can waive the 90-minute rule. So for example, it's not unusual for uh, like, for example, uh, let's say, uh, you're like at, say, the 30th floor and you're filling a column using crane and bucket. So the cycle time is actually very slow. Uh, so, minsan, it will take more than 90 minutes, including waiting time, before you actually discharge that. But if the concrete still looks okay, usually in allowed din siya. Okay, so that's the technical manager of uh, the cement plant, <laughs> batching plant, <laughs> Comment batching plant answering. So you're wearing different hats, huh? <laughs> okay. Ah, sige po, balik tayo kay uh, Sir Bo. Kasi merong mga questions, Sir Bo, regarding the DPWH uh, safety guidelines because I think they are having difficulty following this. So like uh, the question by Michael Montefalcon, no? he's saying here that... Uh, yeah, how do construction managers manage or control the manpower, materials, equipment, uh, having a hard time to comply with DPWH safety protocols? And in relation to that also, uh, Engineer Mon Aliado, our previous speaker no, last uh, uh, time, is asking this question, uh, IATF uh, or DPWH uh, DO39 requires mandatory on-site or off-site barracks. How does DCI meet this challenge? Mm. Uh, yes, thank you. Both questions are very difficult to answer, but yes, uh, on the on-site barracks, um, uh, in, the, in the projects with uh, staff housing initially already at the site, these were the projects that were able to commence right away uh, during GCQ. Why? Because um, they were isolated. No, they had workers. There were some project sites had 30 to 40 pro um, staff workers already located, confined, quarantined inside for the during the lockdown. So as soon as the uh, uh, ECQ was lifted, MECQ was lifted, they were able to start work right away uh, because in in a sense they were quarantined. They had an immediate available staff house, um, and that is. That's a good side, no? So for, for some projects, staff houses were already in place, uh, but not in a position to accommodate a substantial uh, substantial number. So if you're talking about 30, 40, 50 people, 
there are some projects that had that. No? And that was the ones, th those are the projects that are able to work already. And looking forward, these are the current commitments being placed on the table by some contractors that their headcount, the histogram that they're submitting, reflects a headcount of 50, uh, 60 maximum uh, workers because that's the capacity of the site to, to house. You know? And this is the major constraint that some projects cannot house or you don't want to um, place a, bar a barracks that can accommodate 300 people inside a high-end condominium. You know? what, what utilities will be used? How do you manage waste? These are the questions that were raised by the CP map to the uh, IATF no? on the protocols. The, op the alternative would be to house the workers in an alternative site and transport, provide transport uh, in, in a semi-quarantine effort too. No? Um, but it's isolated also that, but they're able to work and only defined. No? And then we can set some protocols for the new workforce coming in. But to constrain everybody within the confines of the job site, and then confine them there to begin with, that's questionable. Confine them there, quarantine them. And then at the same time, we're unable to guarantee that amongst them, there's nobody who's uh, already afflicted. No? So that's why we're, um, we are requesting that we are appealing this position. Uh, and the alternative is an, uh, a cell, uh, staff house, uh, which uh, provide a staff house as a cell site. No, uh, in proximity uh, with the job site. No. Outside Manila, that's okay. Uh, we can build the house, staff houses within the, within the project site. But when you're talking about VGC, you need to revisit the policy that was rolled out. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Engineer Bo. So really, we need to understand the intent no, of, the, of the directive so that we can perhaps provide some uh, alternatives. Yeah. So which brings me to the next topic of, about innovation, because there are some questions here related to innovation. Uh, Sir Francis, from uh, Mr. Emilio, William Flores and Bile. So uh, may I know if we can consider recycled materials, like those knockdown structures, like buildings, uh, like in other countries, uh, practicing green environment at the same time, uh, incurring less costs if material cost and material, well, material demand and so on. So basically, he's asking about uh, recycling, perhaps. So, so new yes. opportunities. Yeah. So yes, it can be done, and in fact, it has been done. Uh, I guess the big challenge lang is the cost of reprocessing, uh, like say, uh, yung waste from demolition sites. It's actually, you would think it's low, right? but it's actually cheaper to uh, uh, get, uh, like say, mountain rock or river to feed your uh, aggregates plant, for example, than it is to transport uh, knockdown or like dem demolished materials into your plant and then convert them to uh, ag you know, fresh aggregates. Now, um, the alternative is to put up a small crushing plant near the demolition site. Uh, and then crush the material there. But the quality of material that you will get is maybe not good enough for concrete, but might be usable as, like, say, base cores or sub-base. Um, so it's, 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 it's doable, but it's a question of cost and whether a concrete producer, for example, is willing to use uh, demolished material uh, as, as uh, feed material. But for base cores, it's being done. In fact, yung NLEX, I remember a lot of the sub basins sa MLEX and even what was used for asphalt was actually the chopped up remains of the old uh, uh, pavement dun sa NLEX before they upgraded. So it, it's, it's been done. It's doable, not economical everywhere, but under certain conditions, they can be. Okay, thank you. So... It depends on the situation, <laughs> but it can okay. be done. Yes, sir. Sir, I'd like to address one, one of the uh, queries I read. It is very interesting, uh, the use of drones no, uh, mm -hmm. on yeah, yeah. for the inspectorate. Very interesting. Uh, right now, uh, 
personally uh, we've used drones but, but more for presentation purposes no so when you do your monthly reports and you want uh, uh, some of the clients to be a bit impressed and capture his entire area uh, the use of drones is uh, a realistic option quite expensive in a certain way uh, maintenance responsibility of the apparatus uh, there's a learning curve to use it but uh, once we're able to move to that direction and that's where we're headed toward digital um, that could be a very useful tool uh, some stakeholders would opt for warm bodies at the job site uh, that sense of security will always be there um, but the use of drones on the inspection efforts are uh, my 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 actual experience has been limited to the facade no mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing the facade of some structures and you're inspecting the the cladding that is already in place uh, the use of drones is is an option but it's very, it consumes a lot of time as well no but mm -hmm. particularly looking at areas which are difficult to reach no uh, the use of drones is a good alternative but we're not yet there so as on the inspectorate level we're not yet there and maybe it's a good uh, direction moving forward yeah thank you so there is a comment here from Julius Cedro. I think this is also related to uh, innovation. And he says, crisis also generates opportunities. Though at present, the epidemic in Philippines hasn't been much controlled relatively. Are there any opportunities during this current difficult period? He is from SME DB. I think this is an open question, no? opportunities during this uh, COVID in the construction industry, perhaps. So anyone, <laughs> if you might, if you would. Pretty broad, uh, like I said, well, moving virtual is uh, a positive risk. So that has to be exploited. That's the only uh, positive risk that I mentioned uh, that have, has been brought about by this. Uh, on the personal level, there are many opportunities to touch base with your family. But on the professional level, um, I look at the lockdown as a opportunity to learn no in the firm where we work we've been pushing for interdisciplinary uh, expansion you know? so mes need to appreciate the work of the ce ce needs to understand what the electrical engineer is doing so inter you need to learn everything so that's one opportunity the opportunity to learn more uh, but on the commer on the professional on the commercial end if that's what they're talking about uh, Right now, none comes, comes to mind. I don't know about Francis, maybe Francis. Uh, yeah, no, Francis, perhaps. Okay, well, Sammy naman, because demand slowed down, um, we actually uh, took the, it as an opportunity to one, I mean, make like long overdue repairs and upgrades sa planta namin. Okay, so we've been wanting to replace our, like say, the bearings in our plant, except you know, we were busy before that we didn't want to shut down for three days just to fix the bearing. So we keep pushing it, putting it off. Ngayon, we're able to do it. Also, at the same time, for example, quarry development. So quarry development uses up a lot of uh, backhoe time. Uh, and when we were busy, our backhoes were always busy. So quarry development was like falling behind. But now that the backhoe operator is not as busy, so we've actually caught up dun sa quarry development namin. The other thing that, uh, two other things I wanted to mention was yung improvement of environmental facilities like silt traps and dikes so that when we, when demand comes back and we have to grow our supply again, again, we are now, well, more, we have better environmental protection facilities. The last one is um, touching base with our community, yung barangay and the local government and working with them in like supporting frontliners, um, uh, volunteering ways to actually help uh, address whatever parang problems our community and our municipality had in, in I guess, feeding people and making sure that uh, people who didn't have jobs are somehow are able to parang matawid itong situation na to. So those are the things that we focus on. Uh, fixing our plants, accelerating development, uh, and use it as an opportunity to touch base with the community. Okay, thank you. All right, so there are a few questions that are very, very specific. 
And I think this specific question, uh, I would like to ask the technical manager again. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just asked this anyway. From okay. Dan Ayob, okay. sir, what do you think is the future of self-healing concrete here in the Philippines? <laughs> Sorry, self. Self-healing concrete. Uh, Self-healing concrete. Hindi ko na kita. Okay, I saw his question. Um, well, yung, yung as engineer gan kai ko knows, you know, construction projects are very price and cost conscious. So unless you have a special application that uh, really needs self-healing concrete, the I'm sure the customers and maybe boss clients will probably not want to pay for pay for that i don't know he can tell us so if if the customers want it it can be supplied but right now uh, we don't see a lot of uh, parang customers asking for that product okay so one more specific question uh, this is again for you are we practicing dry batch concrete in the philippines uh, this is to, uh, yeah from winston yeah. canado Okay, I actually started answering that question. So, so not that much. So, dry batch concrete, as I interpret it, is so. Lagay mo muna yung materials sa transit mixer because yun nga, you have a challenge of having to deliver concrete beyond the 90 minute limit, di ba? So, what if, for example, you put everything in concrete in the transit mixer, so sand, gravel, and cement, and then when it gets to the site, that's when you add water and uh, admixtures and dun mo na lang haluin. So I, I actually tried that a couple of times. It's not easy. It's actually challenging. So number one, it's so hard to control quality outside of the batching plant. Diba? So unless talagang, unless you really have to, I mean, you only have a limited number of quality control technicians. So unless you really, it's unless it's a really big project, and second, unless the owner agrees to you doing the dry batch approach, mm -hmm. it's challenging. So not many, it can be done, but we don't really have a lot of customers who are willing to uh, to let you do that. Okay, thank you very much. Our time flies very fast. We're down to, uh, I think, two last questions. <laughs> okay, so this is another one from, Yes, I think yeah. This one for again for uh, uh, Doc Francis from Williamson Manguban. Hi, sir Francis. Do you consider the requirement of sustainability in manufacturing your products? Sand, cement, rebar. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So so yeah. So let me talk about. I I, I mean I can't talk about rebar because that's not our product. Yeah. <laughs> let me talk about. Siguro cement. Uh, based on my general and un understanding of. Uh, the cement business. And then also, then I'll talk about parang our company. So in terms of cement, I mean, those guys are really very conscious about um, sustainable uh, production, okay? So are we. And the reason is because, you know, it's so hard to get a permit that you have to do things in a sustainable way for you to be granted a permit. And you have to keep on demonstrating to the regulating agencies that you run your operations in a sustainable way. So for example, after you remove the, uh, like in our case, after we remove yung, yung minerals from the mountain, are we going to restore the return, yung, yung lupa na natira, are we going to restore that in a way that is, uh, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to convert that into forest land? Are you going to convert that into a reservoir that can be enjoyed by the community? You have to answer that question even before you are granted a permit. And you have to demonstrate that you are going to do it, number one, by giving a plan. That's called a final mine rehabilitation plan. And second is, as soon as you, they give you the permit, you actually have to start contributing a fund based on the plan that you submitted and in in a five year period that fund has to be fully funded already so 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 the, in answer to the question yes we have to do it in a sustainable way because that is a requirement for us to get a permit and aside from the fact that of course we want to be welcomed by our neighbors if we just blast and blast without any concern uh, they're not going to be happy 
for uh, you know, very quickly. Okay, thank you. So we must be good neighbors to everyone. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we have run out of time for our Q&A. For those who still want to ask questions, you may still do so by typing in uh, your questions and uh, we will forward them to uh, our uh, resource persons this afternoon. So this afternoon, uh, we have uh, learned about uh, some strategies no? uh, that uh, Engineer Bo has uh, uh, discussed. Uh, the strategies on uh, dealing with uh, risk, for example, dealing with the stakeholders, uh, dealing with the with uh, time constraints, cost constraints, and, and many more. And he has also shown us uh, uh, the things that their company is uh, is doing no? uh, in this uh, time of uh, pandemic. And he has uh, generously answered uh, questions. Uh, even uh, very specific questions uh, from our audience. And uh, Dr. Francis uh, also uh, gave us an over overview or an outlook of the supply of uh, uh, the basic uh, constru construction uh, materials, uh, the steel, uh, rib uh, steel rebar, the cement, aggregates, uh, and of course the concrete. So maybe uh, for parting words, I'd like just to ask uh, a few words from both of our speakers, uh, just to sum up uh, perhaps our discussion today. Uh, a few parting words. Malang. Let yes, me start. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Francis, ako na mauna. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I really appreciate uh, being invited to this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, it's a good, good uh, method to go back to your alma mater. So thank you very much to the UPICE and the more power. No? Uh, for the viewers, um, now is not the time to make money. Now is the time to survive. Now is the time to help each other, to show, to show some humanity and um, work together. No? Uh, that's our main objective. Um, it's not just a matter of um, making money anymore it's also a matter of helping each other out no so that's what we're trying to do we're not just pushing for resumption of work we're pus pushing for resumption of work uh but compliance to protocols to realistic protocols uh we realize the the impact that this will have on the working community if we just continue to um avoid avoid the risk so we also need to go back to work and we, we can appreciate the stakeholders' concerns. And at the same time, we also appreciate the position of the government. So now is the time for compromise. Now is the time for handshakes to be done for commitments on future working uh, partnerships together. So that's our call out. That's our, the position of the CM. Uh, again, thank you very much to all the sponsors of this event. Uh, thank you thank very you much, uh, Engineer Bo. Before I go to uh, Sir Francis, uh, Sir Francis, uh, perhaps you can answer the question of uh, Engineer Aliga. <laughs> Malakas si Tito Aliga sa atin, eh. <laughs> Can you? Given, yeah, I'll, I'll just read this uh, from uh, Sir Tito Aliga. Given that lockdown conditions are here to stay, and our new graduates will probably find employment opportunities in the CE field severely limited maybe except for work that can be done on a work from home mode, what suggestions would you make for these graduates to pursue? What should academe undertake to prepare their current students? Uh, Bo and Francis have addressed the opportunities for currently employed, but what about for the current students? From Sir Tito of URDFI. And also your last words. <laughs> Bo, you wanna take that question first or ako muna? Ako, umpisa ko lang. I touched on this, you know, uh, and I, I just took it out of my presentation. But in 1986, when we graduated, we were 34, my batch, and only a third of us proceed, uh, pursued in uh, CE. Um, that's because there was nothing in the market. This is what we, you are afraid you might experience today. Uh, two thirds actually ended up in computers. Uh, hopefully, that, 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 that doesn't happen now. Uh, there is still a market. There is. We will move to normalcy. You have different a different set of tools, so use it. But in the meantime, if there's this a lockdown or you 
you experience a shortage of community of opportunities then use it as a time for learning for expanding your craft expanding your knowledge no if you can find a job go to dci <laughs> Okay, Sir Francis. Uh, so, so, si Boy essentially gave the... Si Boy and I graduated <laughs> almost the same time. So, pa yata kami nag-board exam, no? So, so the, tama yan. What we are going through now was what we went through in 1985-1986, just before People Power Revolution. But even immediately after, I mean, even immediately after People Power Revolution, hirap din maghanap ng trabaho because, you know, people were in a parang wait-and-see mode and the government was not very stable yet, so not a lot of people wanted to invest. I was actually one of the people Bo mentioned na si graduate na lumipat ng computers, muntik na ako. So in fact, I already applied for a job and I was set up, parang I was on parang track for getting a second interview in this parang software company. But I decided, anyway, nagsii na ako, tsagain ko na lang. But my wife, my girlfriend at the time, pero wife ngayon, went through the application process and she's now like a big time computer professional sa BPI. No? So what I missed out, she took over. But in my case, um, I know, I mean, um, the nice thing about having an engineering degree is that skill is actually applicable for many things. So, uh, well, I'm no longer a fresh graduate, but you know, after a long technical career, I was able to uh, be learn how to become a manager, like a professional manager. And then, you know, an entrepreneur also running my own business. So again, using the same skills that I learned in the job and also what I learned from the university. So you'd be surprised what you can do with an engineering education that is not necessarily civil engineering. Okay, so thank you very much. I think, uh, <laughs> yeah. Run out of time, really. Okay. So, okay. thank you very much again, uh, Sir Bo and uh, Sir Francis. Thank you so much to our two speakers who are both members of uh, alumni, as he says, alumni, uh, as Dr. Chola introduced them a while ago. Engineer Bo used to be the president no, in the year that EDSA happened, EDSA revolution happened in 1986. We really thank you for sharing your, your knowledge, your experience with us this afternoon. We know you are very busy. We really appreciate that you spent this whole afternoon with us today. So we learned a lot from you. And again, uh, thank you for giving us a clearer outlook. Not everything is bleak. No? Uh, Thank you for, for helping us uh, deliver no, this modest contribution of UPICE to, the, to our profession by, by disseminating this, kinds of, this kind of webinar. So maraming maraming salamat. We really appreciate your, your uh, contribution in this afternoon's activity. And with that, I was reminded of a lot of things no, na pwede pa natin gawin in the future, pero offline na lang or for a next activity. So, muli, let's, let's thank no, uh, Dr. Francis Felizardo and Engineer Bo Gangalco. So, palakpak tayo. And then, uh, thank you to our alumni who are here. We can see among the participants, I think, special shout out to those who are abroad, who, who are in a different timeline, like uh, Val and Rochi Mejia, thank you so much for attending. Thank you also to Mike de Guzman and again to Rampi Inolito. Uh, he's a big help in putting this together. It was just one text away from our speakers and we were able to organize this and to plan for this. Uh, to all our alumni who have been supporting us, uh, ICE wouldn't be able to achieve everything that uh, it, ha it has been able to achieve, if not for the very strong support of our alumni. And of course, the support of UPRDFI. Thank you, sir. Tito Aliga. Thank you also for your question, for the last question, for the continuous support. 
And then special thanks to PICE. Uh, the president, President Bonsuero was here earlier. I haven't checked if he's still here up to now, but we really appreciate your, your support. Thank you to our members of PICE. Sa mga hindi pa po nag-member, sali na po kayo. By the way, we're being streamed live both in the uh, the FB pages of UPICE and PICE and PICE. Maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you also to ACI Philippines. So we again, thank you Sir Mon Aliado for being with us this afternoon. And also Ma'am Ellen Chua and the other members of ACI. We really appreciate their presence. To our, to all our participants, maraming maraming salamat po. And we hope you continue following our webinars. We have two more webinars for the next two Fridays. Next Friday would be about transportation, uh, how it's going to change, what the changes are. And then the week after is about the building act or the revised uh, building code. Yeah, maraming maraming salamat for, for your support. We had a lot of... Uh, uh, participants, combined participants from Zoom, Facebook, that's around 500. And then later on, uh, you can still check our the replay of this. Thank you. So just a reminder, please fill up the feedback form, which is shown now. Uh, you can fill it up now and then so that we can send you our your certificate of participation if you need them. So with that, uh, again, thank you so much for, for joining us this afternoon. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. And that is the new normal outlook of construction engineering and management in the Philippines. We hope you learned a lot from the discussions this afternoon. Do not forget to follow us in all our social media accounts and see you next week for our next webinar. Stay safe, everyone.